What if you could tell before the ash starts to billow when a volcano is about to erupt? Lasers may offer a way. We'll show you this week on Light Matters. This is Light Matters for May 20th, 2015. I'm your host, Justine Murphy. On this week's show, we reflect on this year's Clio Conference in San Jose and revisit a 19th century imaging technique. But first, we'll see how lasers and a box full of jelly can help us understand volcanoes and even save lives. A team made up of researchers from universities in the UK and Australia has developed a technique that could enable faster and more accurate detection of volcanic unrest. They created scale models in the lab that allowed them to study the plumbing systems of volcanoes by demonstrating how magma ascends from great depths up to the surface through a series of connected fractures. Colored water was injected into a tank filled with gelatin to mimic rising magma. The researchers used a green laser sheet to illuminate fluorescent particles in the gelatin, allowing them to track the simulated magma's movement. The simulations led to the discovery of a previously unknown drop in pressure as magma rises that can drive the release of dissolved gases, potentially causing the magma to explode and erupt. The research was published in Earth and Planetary Science Letters. 2015 is the International Year of Light, and people around the world are celebrating in creative ways. This week, assistant editor Serena Tracy takes us to Philadelphia's Wagner Free Institute of Science, where visitors were invited to ditch their camera phones and celebrate the light techniques of yesteryear. The cyanotype was one of the first non-silver photographic technologies, and attendees of the event could create their own, using the power of the sun to show off the eerily beautiful shapes of flowers, plants, and other objects. Silhouette portraits were also cut by the young and old alike, many emulating those vintage profiles hanging in your grandma's house. But the Institute didn't stay in the 19th century for long. Today's technologies were also celebrated, with mechanical arts projects and the latest in mobile computer vision technology. All passers-by were met with a different way of seeing themselves, and a glimpse of what's to come in imaging technology. The event was part of the Philadelphia Science Festival. Thanks, Serena. Coming up after the break, highlights from Clio 2015. But first, a word from our sponsor. Hello, my name is Mark Nevitt. I'm the market development specialist for Xeon Chemicals, representing a cycle of polymer, the trade name of Xenex, Xenor, and Xenor Film. Xenex optical polymer is used in many applications for imaging, such as mobile device camera lens, 3D sensing, gesture recognition, as well as bioscience, life science imaging applications. You can find more information and our contact details on our website at www.znx.com. The annual Conference on Lasers and Electro-Optics, or CLEO, was held last week in San Jose, and web managing editor James Lowe was there. He caught up with industrial photonics editor Rod Pedrotti to go over the highlights. So James, great to have you back here with us. I understand you spent uh, three days at Clio, and five of six of last year's Nobel Prize winners in photonics-related fields gave plenary talks there, and I'd love your take on that, what you heard. Well, they were, they were great, and, and I, like everybody else, uh, took advantage of the opportunity to get our picture taken with uh, Shuji Nakamura, who was one of the winners for Blue LEDs. But uh, no, the, the plenary talks were all great. Uh, one of the most interesting ones, uh, from my perspective, was given by uh, Miles Paget from the University of Gla Glasgow. Uh, he was talking about orbital angular momentum, which, according to him, is, is a fairly overlooked property of light that uh, might have some, some interesting uses down the road. But I hope that it's actually made us think differently about light. That as well as thinking about the intensity structure, <coughs> the image, we think about what the face fronts are doing. Are they twisted? Are they cubic? That would be an heavy beam. Are they conical? That would be a Bessel beam. All these beams, if you took pictures of, look very similar, but actually do different things on propagation because of the way their face is structured. And so he says uh, you could perhaps exploit orbital angular momentum to uh, open up new fields in imaging or sensing or even communications. That was a really intriguing quote, and, but it does talk about what's coming up in the future down the road. How about as what relates to technology now? Was any of that discussed? Sure. Well, one of, one of the big announcements at Clio was uh, IBM has uh, come out with some new capabilities for fabricating uh, these fully integrated silicon photonic chips. 
and, and they're planning to uh, make this foundry service available to uh, outside chip designers. So I, I talked with an IBM researcher, Douglas Gill, and he told me all about why this development is unique. We've had announcements of individual component performance, monolithically integrated components with the electronics and the electro-optic components, but this is bringing all of those technologies together. The, the monolithic transmitter, which has the CMOS monolithically integrated with the electro-optic modulator, on-chip control, and um, then thermally tunable wavelength division multiplexed filters, receivers, it's a polarization diverse uh, configuration, so, so it's, it's demonstrating every aspect of the technology. So James, that clip we just saw and heard is very intriguing as well. What he's essentially saying is not only is this decreasing the cost of producing these chips, but also decreasing the footprint size of these chips in data centers. That's exactly right. Interesting, interesting. Now, you were at last year's Clio as well. How would you say this year's Clio event compares or contrasts to the year prior? Sure. Uh, it was certainly a little bit quieter this year. Uh, OSA, one of the groups that, that uh, puts it on, according to their numbers, the attendance was about 4,400, which is about 600 less than, than last year. Uh, and I certainly heard from a number of the exhibitors that they just weren't as busy as they'd hoped to be. Uh, having said all that, though, there, there was still lots to see and do on the show floor, uh, including the, the tech transfer program. Now, uh, we as Photonics Media sponsor that, but I, I think I can say objectively that it, it just keeps getting better and better. The, the pitch panel this year especially, uh, they not only had the uh, young entrepreneurs making their pitches about their interesting new technologies, but they had a, a, a panel of expert judges kind of giving Shark Tank style feedback, maybe, maybe not quite so intense, but still really robust. Um, and also there was a really good panel discussion on, on sensing. Uh, interesting for the fact that a lot of non-optical technologies were coming up that are kind of uh, moving in on our turf. Uh, William Yang, who's the CEO of Basebeck, was talking about how his company is getting into mass spectrometry uh, because his customers are, are, uh, are asking for a way to detect trace gases and, and optical techniques just can't do that. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Jeff Fanton from Rivera was talking about X-ray photoelectric spectroscopy, which he says is uh, superior for uh, gauging the thickness of, of thin films. Um, and also there was uh, just some opportunities to have some fun. Uh, Newport does the student lounge. They've done that for a number of years. Uh, this year they, they upped the ante. They brought in some arcade machines so you could play Galaga. Uh, they, have, they had a foosball table. Um, and there's the, the, the tech playground, uh, which you can go to all the different booths and test out some of the technologies, play some games. Uh, New Newport, again, had a, had a fun challenge where they combined a bunch of their technologies, their lasers and optics and uh, uh, motion systems, to have a game where you needed to uh, point your laser gun at a, at a moving sensor, and whoever kept it on that sensor the longest got the, was the winner. Oh, that's cool. That's, that sounds like a lot of fun. And based on what you said, although attendance may be lower, content certainly was not. And as we both know, this industry just does not slow down. Oh, sure, sure. Well, speaking of not slowing down, I, I hear you're on the road next month. Yeah, yeah, I am. I'll be hitting uh, Laser Munich at the end of June. And it'll be interesting when I come back from that. I'll be there about a week. We'll, we'll have to touch base again on the laser technology I see there. And brainstorm as to where we think this is going and how this compares and contrasts to what you just saw. Absolutely. I look forward to it. Me too. Me too. Well, thanks so much, James. And again, great having you back here. And that's it for this edition of Late Matters. Leave your impressions of Clio in the comment section below or tell us your thoughts about anything else in this week's show. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again next week. <laughs>